Lauren, you look like the picture of summer. No, if you do it, it will come. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think it's going to be like 50s in the <laughs> Drinking the the 80s today. <laughs> Michael, well, only until about two. We just got a weather alert. And we're gonna get a pretty bad storm, I think. Oh yeah. Thunder and stuff. You think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, because I put in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> All those tender little leaves are gonna get splattered and hit by hail and all sorts of stuff. Hail? I hope not. Well, that's what I heard on this morning's radio. That's oh, great, great, cool, perfect. So can I ask something before uh, we start? Um, I checked the uh, meetings or minutes, a uh, meeting minutes um, for other committees. Uh, if you want me continue, which I like to, I think we need to decide which um, city committees we need, uh, we wanna focus uh, because there are so many of them. And so far I only find something in the energy advisory committee. They are talking about energy metrics. Maybe, you know, we can help. So it could be more equitable, I don't know, uh, but yeah, we need to <clears throat> decide which ones we want to look, uh, you know, into their minutes and also um, how uh, long I need to go back. Uh, just, you know, in case you want to talk today or future, in the future, I just want to mention this before we start. Yeah, I think that'll be, you know, moving off of our conversation about how the meeting last Wednesday went, it feels like 10 years ago, right? So is it okay if we hold off on that convert like for next steps until we get there real quick, Helen? Yeah, yeah, whenever Does you that want. Make sense? I just wanna mention this before we start, you know, if you Thanks think that oh, we don't have yeah. to do that, then I will just do it for personal <laughs> interest. Yeah, yeah. You know, but if you wanna make it like a more official, then I'm ready, you know, to uh, move forward. But we need to really decide which ones we want to look into because there are so many of them, as you know. <laughs> and some of them are really, yeah, can be helpful for us that much. So that's all. Thank you. Cool. Um, so, yeah, so on this agenda, I just got, um, you know, public comment, check ins, sharings, um, and then I'm really digging in and reflecting on the city committee chair meeting. Um, and then we can go into like what the next steps from from that are um, and then thinking after we did that because we'll do some of that like reflection as we do like check ins and go around of then reviewing and approving the minutes and then have Keisha join at nine for creative discourses. Um, like kind of going over their report their draft report. Um, and then talking a little bit more about the plan for what that's going to look like. And then probably about five minutes at the end for just like fundraising, recruitment, so then for next meeting. Um, uh, how does that agenda look for folks? Cool. So maybe we can do just a quick go around of check-ins. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, any learnings that you've had, um, uh, you know, over the past couple of weeks? And then reflections from the city committee chair meeting. Does that sound good? Um, if anyone wants to start. Yeah, I can go <clears throat> first. Uh, so I have been attending um, different conferences um, this summer and uh, first two of them about DEI and also women leadership. So I have been learning a lot. And also I just signed up for a Cor Cornell University <clears throat> uh, DI uh, certificate. So I will uh, finish it at the end of July. So uh, I can share what I learned, you know, when I finish, maybe it might help to our work too. And because there are so many things about this equity and justice things that I have never 
hurdle. So these are um, these are very <clears throat> productive uh, conferences for me. And other than that, like Lauren, I start wearing my summer dresses. So I'm just like, if I start wearing it, the summer will come. <laughs> then I just heard that today there will be thunderstorms. So I am not doing well, but I will keep doing it. And uh, for the uh, chair meeting, I really like talking to other people. And I've noticed that we are all uh, working for the, you know, same bigger, you know, goal. Uh, and we need to talk uh, to each other more often. So thank you for all the effort, um, Shaina, you did to arrange the meeting. So yeah, that's all. <laughs> I just want to say, I think that was all Jeremy. So thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy, too. <laughs> yeah, I can go. Um, we, uh, first off, I'm still catching up. So uh, I don't know. It, things have probably happened in the last few weeks. I don't know. But I'm on it and I'll be maybe on top of things by next week is my goal right we know we'll find out together um <laughs> but I will say when as regards to like a, a change in uh that relates to y'all's work is um we're currently in our um union contract negotiation time um and something that we noticed and had never updated is just our language is really non-inclusive in our, our contracts. Not what the language says, but like refer to people as he. And, you know, just the, the literal language was non-inclusive. So we've made that change and that's been really good. And obviously the unions have no problem with that. So it's just been like nice and, and just one of those little up, I think, to making a non-inclusive workforce or a workplace um, feel not welcoming. And it was a really nice thing to be able to make a change on very quickly. So thank you. <laughs> I can go. Good morning, everybody. Um, doing OK. Feeling very sluggish this morning for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe it's the heat that's already bearing down on me. <clears throat> it's um, the weather changing. It's happening. Yeah, it, it does. Um, and yeah, I think just as far as the committee, the committee chairs meeting, I thought it was really went really well. Um, and I think I was just inspired by all the folks who are doing so much work to help our community thrive. Um, and that's just a wonderful thing to see so many people. And I thought one great outcome of our gathering was just getting folks connected and hearing about each other's work. Um, so I thought it was a it was a really inspiring gathering. That's it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, <clears throat> so I missed most of the committee chair meeting and I, I apologize for that. I, there were so many addresses. I went to all the addresses that I had and they all led back to the wrong one. Um, so it took me a while to finally find one. And then by then the meeting was almost all over. So I'm sorry that I missed it, um, but um, I, I did, I have, heard good things from people who were there and they thought it was a useful meeting to have and um so good for you shana and jeremy and all the people who were involved for planning it um it, it apparently did some of what you wanted it to do um i was in arizona new mexico as you know last me came back with a head cold so i've been out of commission for most of the last two weeks um which is one of the reasons that there were no minutes for the April, whatever, 24th, but I, I did 28th, but I did find my notes. So I'll get those done and um, get to you as soon as I can.
I can check in. Um, generally, uh, doing pretty well. The legislature wrapped up, which for my work life means things get much uh, less dramatic, which is nice. Um, and yeah, I guess just reflecting on the um, on the city meeting, I I mean, similar to everyone else, like it it just kind of struck me in that moment, like how rarely the group gets together and like there's all these amazing volunteers, um, as you all noted, doing this great work for the city and everyone's kind of just like off doing their their good work and you know, some connections and overlap happen, but like, you know, we hear a lot of it at city council because people are coming in and presenting, but it's like the the whole picture of everything is rare. So I was like, how do we how do we foster just more of that collaboration. Like in our little subgroup, there were like all these ideas bouncing back and forth that people had for each other. Um, it was great to see that like energy and the different people's like expertise and networks and connections and just, um, so just, you know, I think like the, the equity pieces, great conversations and just with that like networking and cohesion around all these efforts that are really related, but off on their own tracks, so some good food for thought of like how to keep people like excited and doing all this like amazing volunteer work and making the most of it and giving them more resources too to do it. So that's kind of some of my reflections on it. I think that leaves me, yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, this is Michael, I'm really sorry. And I, I just want to apologize again for the, the snafu on the tech and I think you were deaf you were actually there for the most you know all of the important stuff of like the reflections and and the conversation you know it was really just a half hour with like of, of us like talking at people and all the all the stuff that you you know already um and and um I have it recorded I sent it out to one um person who asked for it that Cameron connected me to and then I'm not sure if I should do anything else with that recording or like what the follow-up plan is following the um, committee, following the meeting. Um, so maybe that could be, uh, could be an idea. Um, but yeah, I uh, screwed in my porch a couple of weeks ago and I've been out here every day. And so that's been really amazing. That's how I'm doing like physically, emotionally, spiritually, everything is out working outside. Um, and I, um, yeah, I, we've been, uh, you know, I've been, I've been doing just like a lot of thinking and, and, you know, discussions at work and stuff about, um, like affinity groups and just like, I just thought it was really, you know, interesting and great to see how we're all like at the city committee meeting, how we're all, um, you know, like doing the, like everyone's really digging in and doing the work. And like, this is like super, so, um, at the forefront of like everyone's doing this work is at the forefront of everyone's mind I feel like in these different spaces and yet we're all still kind of like floundering you know just being like oh yeah like homelessness isn't in the town has never been in the city plan and like equity has not been has like a line in like Montpelier Live before and so like how can we you know build you know like build in the, like the structures of accountability in in these different spaces and that's like exactly why we're doing this um, but and then also just like interesting to see how like we're all trying to do this work and like to make us general assumptions like we're presenting as a pretty white group and so um, and of just like how, what does that mean for like creating like affinity spaces within the city and so of um, just that was just getting I was just my my wheels have been spinning on that since for the past week and so um, and like knowing that pre presentation is not like what race and class is and um, yeah, just thinking, just thinking about those things. So, um, yeah, really interesting to hear that you're doing a certificate, Pellin. Want to hear more about that? That sounds awesome. Um, and the contract language changing, Cameron, so cool. Um, yeah, and then uh, also, yeah, um, just recognizing of like where we were as a city and as a country a year ago. Um, you know, with um, the murder of George Floyd last year, um, yesterday, I think, um, and just like this, um, yeah, this, this 
months this time last year it just feels like um a lot's changed and a lot's the same and so um yeah those are some of my reflections I think of like um just like other just like reflections from the city committee chair of like follow-up and next steps um so we've got this like Helen reviewing the minutes we've got next steps for like circling back with committee members and following up with them um maybe should we pull up Cameron's notes and just make sure we're like we're capturing I, I haven't I'm gonna pull up Cameron's notes here <laughs> thank you Cameron for the notes <laughs> but any other kind of like agenda items for us to talk about in the follow-up in the next steps Thank you everyone for sending me the the notes you took so I could add it all together. <clears throat> Do you want me to share them or we good? I've I've got them. Does everyone have them pulled up or what would be helpful? Yeah. So I think we've maybe got like immediate next steps, which is like sending out the notes and the recording. Um, I think once we approve the minutes, we can do that easy peasy. I think then we've got the like midterm next steps, which is like following up with all of these different folks who like requested resources or had ideas that were um, wanted to like continue the check-in. Um, and I think that was primarily um, Montpelier Alive, um, the boop, 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 boop. Sorry, I, I can't. Now that I'm just on my computer outside, I don't have my, my, my competing screens. Um, the stipend idea, the Connecting housing and home homelessness and planning, right? Yeah, I think on that, um, it sounded like <clears throat> I think Kirby was his name was interested in um, joining us to present some materials for us to talk through with the city planning commission or the yeah the planning committee. And just for my edification, can you list out the groups that wanted to speak to you again? So I had That's what I'm trying to do right now. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. No, this is great. Do it. Do it. <laughs> Homelessness task force and, and our planning um, committee, but that's all I caught. I mean, I don't know if I heard yeah. a request to get together with us, but um, the the arts commission felt like they really needed some support around, um, you know, their participation in, in their process. Public art for participation, and then also the history on the website. Updating the, the like story of the history of Montpelier. That'll be interesting. Michael, I might like look to you to help me figure out because you're my go-to historian, right? Um, who to help me figure that narrative out. So who do I like help, who do I pay to, to do a better job of figuring out what our, our actual, like what that narrative should be. If it exists somewhere already, that would be great, but I don't think it does. Not the lens that y'all are, are talking about, you know, like looking at more of the native folks who are here first kind of lens. So, uh, Michael, I'll take any ideas. You are also muted. 
Yeah, some of them will be the native folks will, that will be easier than some of <clears throat> some of the other topics of, for equity and um, be, because there's a lot of archaeological done, work done. So, um, but I'll think of some people who might be uh, interested in doing that. I have to find actually first start and by reading what's there that would be helpful. <laughs> I know I I didn't circle back and reread it. Nope. <laughs> I mean, I was I don't know if there's other like short term immediate steps. Like I was wondering kind of in line with the idea idea Jeremy had like I mean I know everyone's schedules are stretched so thin so maybe it would be like twice a year or something but um like I, I definitely again found like energy and I think if they're especially like because there was an opportunity to like learn and reflect on something you're not already doing in your committee like I think if it's just like a get together and re report out what you're doing um, but I think like some something that was like structured around like collective collective learning and like thinking through an issue like equity which we could probably do again and again and again and keep learning and keep doing different things like or there might be other um areas too where that might be valuable um so i do think trying to think of something like that um i mean the other piece i'm thinking about is like you know i know cameron you were talking about for the budget next year that you know, bringing the equity tool in earlier and like thinking through that for the departments. And I'm wondering about like city committees that are making budget requests. Um, is there, you know, is that like an, a, an easy like next touch point with committees of like, can we support them in thinking through the equity implications of budget requests? Like what are they asking for and what do they wanna do with it? Um, what are how are priorities being set for the upcoming year and and maybe it's like with our capacity it would be like what are what are a couple of the like this year and then you know build from there or something but that might be just a really tangible way to like work with some groups of how are priorities being set and how are city resources being spent i really like that and, idea oh sorry sorry palin so uh, I think it is good to meet with them twice a, a year. Maybe we can meet at the beginning of the year, right? And we can talk about our plans about equity, justice, you know, and they can also mention their ideas. Then at the end of the year, we can come together. Okay, what did we do, right? And uh, when they mention about their plans, maybe we can come up ideas in our meetings how we can help them and send like a little kind of I don't know agenda or help guide to them so they can include those things in their you know actions you know something like that By beginning of the year, you mean um, fiscal year? So like in August or so, yeah. So I think I I think I've, this is a good, I can put that out in the email to, you know, where I'm, you know, the follow-up email of, of offering that and kind of see what the response is and, you know, bring that back next time. You know, that's a great idea. And then I'll just do like the, those immediate follow-ups um, as well. Um, maybe can we approve the minutes for sending those out? Um, does anyone want to make a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the city committee chair meeting minutes. I second. 19. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Look at us go. Okay. And so then, Helen, your, can you remind me of what the goals were for looking back through the agendas? So uh, my original idea was, is there anything uh, each committee is talking about 
justice, equity, you know, anything we are working on? Are they talking about those things? Because in our meeting, they mentioned, oh, we want to do this, we want to do that. And they were all related to our topics. So I said, okay, let me look if they were talking about this before, or is this the this meeting, you know, of, um, make them to think about those things. And as I said, I check quite a bit, uh, most of the recent minutes, and I didn't see anything that we were talking about in our meeting. Maybe, maybe not that specific. Maybe I missed yeah, something. That's great, Helen, because I think that that's like really holding people accountable for like, you. if this is what you said you were talking about, but it's clearly not reflected, then did you talk, like, how do we communicate? It comes right back to the conversation y'all had at the thing about how do we communicate equity issues, right? Like if mm -hmm. we're writing it down, then it's not real. Yeah. <laughs> So maybe we can uh, talk about what kind of things we want to see and we can tell them, uh, can you add this agenda item in your, in your meeting? Like one item, right? Something like that. We can help them um, to start their conversation. And again, I only see like in the energy advisor committee, they are talking about energy metrics. So I thought, yeah, it's a good, good thing maybe because we talk about this, right? Green buildings, you know, affordable houses and everything. So we can work together. Uh, so that, that's, that was the idea. And also in the park commission, they are getting quite a bit donation and money. So maybe we can talk to them. How do you do this? How do you succeed? It was pretty impressive how much money they collect. So it's like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> they are experts. So because we were talking about, you know, collect money for our, you know, report too. So these are the things. I feel like I'm spying, but because it, they are like public documents, I think it is okay to, uh, you know, go over that. <laughs> yeah, you can show up to any of those. That's the thing that's like really funny. I think I think the city does need to work on, on like, making it very clear that these anyone can show up at any time and do whatever, right? Like, I think it's easier now that work I can come, like work is here right now, work is recording this. People could watch this later if they want to, but like, then show up to all of them, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, with the energy and synergy in the meetings, right, when we are together, I am sure that everyone, oh, we want to do this. Yeah, it's great, mm -hmm. let's do this. But somehow we have to keep motivating people right so maybe we can do it through our analysis or yeah come up with an idea please you know add this item in your agenda and just talk about it it will be good for justice and equity issues you know so something like that i'll put that in the follow-up email too i i feel like this is becoming a pretty long <laughs> follow-up email and so i'm wondering if i can like draft it and Helen, maybe can I send it to you for, okay, that'd be great. Um, anything else around the meeting? I'm seeing that Keish is joining. Look at our, our timing is like flawless, perfect. I, I do want to just say that um, I'm not trying to blow smoke or nothing, but this was like really valuable as you know we've talked us about city staff about doing these kind of things um often you know but i think it takes a special group of people to to pull together um such a large group and and manage it really well and give them an objective right so it's not just sit around and talk at each other and there was like an actual goal and i think people learned a lot and it opened up a lot of conversations i think and I'm just really grateful for that. Um, so I would love to see those continue um, and anything I can do to help support that happening would be out anything, right? So, um, you know, twice a year sounds good to me, but anything that I can do to help facilitate that because those are those are really important. And um, I also wanna say before, case is completely on, it's just, um, sorry about the uh, Zoom link snafu on my end my bad i will talk about, 
Uh, I'm going to just chalk up everything that happened in the last three weeks to extreme fever. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know why, how you tried to do anything. Oh my God. Um, I am just, I just realized one more thing is, um, Jeremy, if we get the Miro board PDF or something like that, I think that could be, can, can that, can I send that out? Even though that's, if that's yeah. approved with the notes or something like that, just like having that visual representation of the synergies. Yeah, I can send you that. And then I'm seeing uh, Keisha still trying to join. So let me see if I can put in the chat. Well, while we're in this pause, can I ask Pellen what um, you said you were getting a certification in in DI? What what is that? I'm writing in the chat now. It's oh, Cornell okay. University DI certificate. And what is DEI? Oh, yeah. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. OK, thank you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I I felt the same way the first time I heard it, right? Oh, what is it? <laughs> then now I'm like, yeah, DEI. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was like a, <clears throat> a federal agency or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. And hi, Keisha. Can you hear me? Yes. Hear us now? Great. Perfect. Awesome. <laughs> Great. We like just wrapped up. We had perfect timing. So um, yeah. So yeah, thinking we can like go over the the draft here of like what yeah what we saw what the you know proposals are things like that um and then yeah just leaving like five or ten minutes at the end um or you know we could, this can be as long as short as we need of it but just have leave a few minutes at the end just to um kind of do a check-in for our next meeting and close out so but um let me hand it over to you go ahead amazing okay i'm trying to do i was trying to do um I'm just going to do it in my little Gmail because I want to make sure we're, we're, we have the same document. Um, so it's the same page numbers as what we sent you, et cetera. So I will do that. Um, let me make it a little bigger if I can. How's that for folks? Okay. And feel free to unmute and you know, I, I would say, unless Shana, you have something else in mind, people can ask questions as we go, especially if it's a clarifying question. And I'll share if I feel like that gets answered later on. Um, and, you know, and so yeah. should I introduce so myself? I, yeah, I think it would be great if you could introduce yourself. And again, that's the goals of this are to get kind of the, this is like the first look at the responses. So this is not the final report. This is the draft. This is like an opportunity for us to be able to like, give input onto it and like we initially were on this super super tight deadline because we were going this the the results of this were going to be presented at city council like next week is that right yeah. um but now we're pushing that off to july is that right i want to make sure i'm getting the dates like just to get sorry i should have provided this context before we dove in but like we're, we're giving feedback um or just like sharing ideas sharing thoughts if there's you know anything that should be to be changed. And then what's the timeline of this moving forward, Cameron? Yeah, that I mean, July. Yeah. I don't have it in front of me. But oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, Great. I will, I will put that in the notes. And when we have that. Yeah, I, I, I don't have it in front of me either. But you know, I was like there, frantically there. trying to find Sue's email. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, we we're open to trying to 
bump up the date. It's just the two particular dates of the meetings were like a graduation. And I'm with my grandparents who were in their nineties who survived COVID for the first time in every year. So they were just like really times that we could not do, but we could work, you know, around that. If it's not a normal city council meeting or, or wait till July was sort of where we're at. Um, so apologies there, but, you know, I think it's, it'll be the culmination of a lot of other people being able to give, uh, you know, feedback and share thoughts um, as well. It, it could be individual city councilors as well before that major meeting. But yes, this is a draft. Um, I am Keisha Rahm, one of three consultants with Creative Discourse that has been working on an equity assessment for the city of Montpelier. I have lost track of time, but I think, you know, we've been really formally working on it and engaging with focus groups and Montpelier residents since January, um, scheduling, you know, formal meetings, but this started in like 2019, just in terms of building the process and, and figuring out what phase one of this work would look like. So here we are. Um, and we um, did have, um, you know, these focus groups that were I think far reaching and really what we try to do is do what we would call thick engagement and thin engagement. The thick engagement is like going really deep with some people who are heavily impacted by what direction this equity work takes and really understanding their experience, the themes that come up for them around, you know, their needs, concerns, the, the ways that they would need things implemented to make a difference and have an impact for them. And the thin engagement is trying to get a really broad sense of the community and, you know, do something like a large survey, which we did. And, and hopefully those align, right? Because if they don't, and we sort of see something interesting that contradicts, you know, then we're really curious, did we miss something and should we go back? Um, so we did speak with over 80 people in our focus groups. Um, this is just a sort of snapshot of um, you know, some of the kinds of folks that we spoke with in the focus groups, the BIPOC and LGBTQ plus groups were affinity spaces. So Tabitha and I led the BIPOC group, you know, as people who identify as black and brown. Um, Sue led the LGBTQ plus group as someone who identifies as part of the LGBT community and we were not present for that. And I just think that helps people really open up in some ways and talk without feeling like they need to qualify what they're saying about their experience in Montpelier. Um, we talked with community leaders, city staff, and first responders. We it, it was important to us to speak to a range of city staff and have a conversation around emergency services and first responders and one around other city staff that do kind of the less urgent or emergency-based work, although I'm sure doesn't always feel that way. Um, we So then we conducted a survey and um, we set a goal with, I believe all of CJAC, but it was through Shana. So, you know, hopefully people, I think all of you really helped get the word out about the survey was my sense. So thank you um, because we set a goal of 300 people as feeling like that would be a, a widely cast net. And we had about 350 people respond to the survey. Um, I do want to note, and we could, you know, we have all the demographic information kind of like connected to, um, to responses. So we, there are ways we can pull things apart that you don't see yet. We just, you know, want to, we, we shared what we thought was interesting when you kind of pull the intersections apart around responses, but 88% of the respondents lived in Montpelier, which I think is a pretty good proportion. I, I think, you know, there was a sense in the focus groups as well that, there are a lot of people who care about Montpelier, who can't afford to live in Montpelier, who spend a lot of time here, consider themselves part of the Montpelier community. So we didn't take out their responses, you know, it, yep. Yeah, I just, I, that seems really important to me. Like we've had members on this committee before that are not Montpelier residents. And just because like, what I, there's some statistic, but that like we double for lunch, you know, like during the legislative session or something, right. you know, like it's like, <laughs> that that does that feels really important I'm like almost curious as to like what if the diff if the experience of people who live in Montpelier how that differs from people who like feel committed enough to Montpelier to fill out a survey mm -hmm. and but don't live here and like what that experience is and this is just reminding me again I wish we had like 
gotten some like home data of like renting <laughs> own yeah this, that would have um or like yeah and um because that is such a issue that I think of okay yeah. yeah, when we look at, you know, when we when we look at um, some of the survey responses broken out with other demographics, you could, you know, people can say, I really would love to see if there's a difference between the people who live in Montpelier and the people who don't on X question. Um, I We also in our focus groups, I felt like had the same about the same proportion, like it felt like, you know, one out of every 10 people or so also didn't live in Montpelier and said and asked, is that okay that I share because I'm part of a mutual aid network or I you know, I'm a person of color who my community is there. So I spend a lot of time there. So we did feel like it was value. No one, exactly. No one was just feeling like messing up this survey or anything. They really are a part of the Montpelier community. Um, we set a goal of at least 10% BIPOC respondents to the survey. And we were able to exceed that as well. Not by much. I just want to note here, 8% preferred not to say their race. So that's fine. When we did do any racial breakdowns, we those people are not included in the because we don't know their race, so we didn't try to guess. Um, but we that means we got about eleven percent BIPOC respondents, so we were we were happy with that. Um, and you know you can see more about the race and ethnic and ethnicity breakdown from there. Um, questions there? Okay. Um, we had a, another, you know, chunk of people who didn't want to um, identify their sexual orientation. Uh, we had 17% of the survey respondents identify as LGBTQ+, and two-thirds identified as heterosexual. So, um, again, if we had any responses where we, you know, wanted to get the LGBT perspective, we didn't put in the prefer not to say decline to state folks. So I think I noted this in the report as well, and in some of our early conversations, I it sound, th you know it's good for me to know that it didn't surprise you know Shana or other folks who you know are participate in government a lot, um, you know to have fifty two percent of your respondents have a master's or doctoral degree um, really stood stood out to us, you know, and so since then what we've learned um, through some of the demographic information that we've exchanged back and forth is that Montpelier already has about double the population of people with advanced degrees um, as opposed to the rest of the state. And the 52% is probably about double again that, you know, so it does say, you know, and when you take that with college degree plus ma master's or doctoral degree, that's a really significant figure that those are the people who, you know, felt, um, they could really take the time and have the capacity to sort of fill out a survey. I, I think we have some comparisons to other communities and it, it's it's normal for people with a college degree or advanced degree to um, respond at a higher rate than they are represented in the population. This is a pretty significant one. Yes. I see uh, your hand. Thank, yeah, thanks, Keisha. My name's Jeremy, by the way. Hi, Jeremy. Um, curious in your experience, um, how comfortable you are kind of making, looking at education levels and making kind of assumptions about class yeah. based on those. And will you, do you make that leap or what, I'm curious about that. Um, it's pretty common in the, in sort of data informed work to use as a proxy um, because it does track pretty well. I mean, from Pew Charitable Trust to all kinds of reputable sources, you know, they they definitely have income brackets that are kind of stratified that go with your degree, your level of educational attainment. Um, so it is often a proxy in data for class. You know, we won't make that direct leap, but it really goes along with the focus group narrative that we heard that it felt like you had to have a lot of time to volunteer um, to the city if you were going to participate, which on some level probably meant you could afford childcare to take time away from work, you know, to, to give more than should, would or should be expected of a volunteer commissioner that's uncompensated. Um, so yes, I think it does track well with this kind of in-group, out-group dynamic that we kept hearing come up. Well, if you're part of this group of, you know, 
all these folks who are lawyers and have master's degrees who, you know, participate and engage in more process, the rest of us feel kind of like we're on the outside of that. So that, you know, really came up. And I think it it is, you know, a dynamic that shows up a lot in the work that there are ways to sort of try to rebalance that. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. So experiences living or working in Montpelier, this again is, is uh, quantitative data that, um, you know, is not abnormal when we, when communities decide to do equity work to start looking and seeing significant differences in how people feel about living in their community. Um, so, you know, you have almost a 20 point spread here between the BIPOC sentiment that they feel a deep sense of belonging in Montpelier and those who identified as white. Um, some people might start to look at this question and say, what is a deep sense? You know, what does it mean? I mean, that's why we did focus groups. So we have a lot of themes that emerged that are qualitative in nature. But I, I just invite people to reflect on this number. This is a pretty significant difference, um, you know, in terms of having about two thirds of, of white folks feel a sense of belonging in Montpelier and 40% of people of color. Um, it was um, not quite as dramatic for people who identified as LGBTQ plus and people who identified as heterosexual about a, why can't I do math right now? Though that's more dramatic, is it more dramatic? What is, yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, I was losing 10% in there somehow. So um, this too is a pretty significant spread. That's what 24% now that my brain is working um, of people feeling that that sense of belonging. Um, you see a kind of similar. Can I, can I ask a question about, yeah. about that? Um, do you have any uh, larger, like national or state um, kind of comparison? How, how these numbers, how these numbers work in terms of how people feel about their identity to a state or their identity as you know citizens of the United States or something like that, so that we see you know we got to sort of get to see where we fit in a in a larger universe of um, of numbers. Yeah, I mean, I I will I will look for national comparisons. Um, you know, I think um, there is there's been like really really informal data to show that often people of color identify more with their city or community than the country. Um, you know, they feel a sense of identity around Atlanta or Chicago or Detroit, you know, not necessarily the United States. Right. Um, so I'll try to find some more of that research and information. Um, I can only give you anecdotal information about Vermont. Um, I, but I can see if that exists somewhere. And we just, I can, Sue, I think sent me, more information about um, other, like Essex, you know, where we have done this work. So we try to, we're trying to ask this question pretty consistently in our work because we found it yields some really interesting um, discrepancies. I don't want to misspeak, but I believe Essex was experiencing a similar divide um, around BIPOC folks, but I don't remember if we did it for sexual orientation um, and education level. Thanks. So um, no college degree, college degree or above, 46% for 64%. And then, um, you know, over half of, of all respondents experienced or observed racism in Montpelier. Um, I'm, you know, we're pretty confident, especially from focus group information that, you know, if you, if you break it down a little further, it's white people who are often observing more of the racism and BIPOC folks who are experiencing more of the racism. Um, we also just wanted to ask people what might influence their participation in public meetings. So we had we had a range of um, you know possible answers. I think there, this is these are four of maybe like eight answers that people could have given. I can, we can, you know, we all uh, will give you the full breakdown. These were the four more popular ones and people wrote a lot of comments um, 
other, the, the, uh, they use the other category to often kind of say some of these things in different ways. So if I saw another pattern that was really clear from the other, I would have sort of elicited that. Um, but, you know, the highest percentage of, of change was um, they would be more likely to participate if they felt confident their participation would have an impact. 57%, um, which is still really significant, would be interested in attending virtually. So you all might, that might help guide you. Did you have different or more participation in virtual meetings? Do people want to keep a hybrid, et cetera? Um, and then these other two were the, you know, third and fourth highest and kind of taken together. That's, you know, an important um, kind of the significant standout, um, you know, idea that that 56% of 40% of people said they're more likely to participate in public meetings if they were hearing from people with a diverse range of lived experiences and they were confident the space could be made or would be made safer for people from marginalized groups. So these were the four more popular answers. So uh, Keisha, did they give any specific example why they don't feel safe? You know, it might not even be that they don't feel safe. I think it connects a little bit with you know, they they may see kind of tense tension in meetings. They may, you know, w feel like, well, how would, a, you know, a person of color show up in this meeting? Would it feel mm -hmm. comfortable for them? So they might have been projecting, you know, a feeling that they they hope and wish the space was safer for people from marginalized mm -hmm. groups. They didn't have to identify as okay. part of one. Um, but it's a very high number for yeah. me, right? Yeah, I can go through the comments because um, that, you know, there were a lot of kind of similar things that, you know, to, to what was said there. There, you know, do we have interpretation? Are there going to be police officers there? You know, do is, is it the same people who attend the meetings kind of thing? So, um, you know, there were other, it, there were the other kind of uh, qualitative answers people gave. Um, but this again is a way to dig deeper. This so this is an assessment where we start to learn. Wow, people are saying you know that they wish the space could be made safer. They wish they could have a more diverse range of experiences represented. How, what does that mean? You know, that's sort of a a, a next question for an equity plan. Um, you know, what would it look like to make spaces safer or you know safer, more welcoming, et cetera? But but I have to say, you know. These were some of the more broad general questions. There were other questions like there would be free food, childcare, et cetera. Those were lower, those were lower on the list. That doesn't mean they're insignificant, but you know, they may they might end up becoming a way that a meeting includes more diverse voices, et cetera, but they weren't as popularly chosen. So um, this we're still in the quantitative. Um, you know, and it's not a competition, it's good information, you know, for, um, for city staff and institutions. Um, so, you know, there is plenty of unsure with some folks because they just didn't know what it would be like to be engaged and valued by the senior center or fire and rescue if you're not a regular consumer of those services. Um, but, um, you know, people, people felt pretty good about the clerk's office, you know, that that stood out to us. What's what's going on there? Or is it just a function of everyone uses it? And most of the time they feel pretty good about their interaction there. Um, the, you know, parking and downtown amenities, um, much more even spread, always feel engaged and valued often sometimes, you know, um, although we, we highlight later that people, when it comes to just downtown, people really enjoy the thriving nature of downtown businesses, et cetera. Um, fire and rescue, you know, it was, it, when, when they did have that interaction, it seems, you know, that they felt valued. Um, so, you know, but a lot of people probably haven't had that interaction is probably a good thing and they felt unsure. Um, city council, you know, that's where you start to see a little bit more of the sometimes never and that, showed up in our focus groups too. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, in my other life as an elected official myself, I know, I know that's hard to see and process. And, you know, another area where we can interrogate that together with the city council, but a lot of feelings of, you know, 
they don't write me back. Um, I don't feel heard. Um, you know, I, I don't know, you know, how to reach out to them. They seem unapproachable to me. Um, and so people have strong opinions about their city council. And that's usually, you know, where a, a main way you go to get help when you're new to exploring city government, you know, you have an elected official. So it's definitely worth exploring further. Um, and again, you, yes, Jeremy. Um, quick kind of question about the city council question, and this may be, it can't be answered, but I'm, I'm wondering about the city council as an institution versus the city council as like my city council representative, yeah. the individual. I'm curious about, it, that might, yeah, that might be hard to make that distinction. But. You know, um, Sue's, the, the LGBT group, I want to say, I just heard um, from her that they spent a, a little while on the city council, you know, mm -hmm. as a group. So she might have more qualitative information there. Um, and we, you know, we've tried to capture some of the themes of what we heard. Um, but I think you're right, as with any sort of elected body, people run pretty hot on cold on people, and they might feel more favorable about their own city councilor or less favorable about their own city councilor than the rest of the body. Um, but they, you know, they really highlighted responsiveness as a concern. Like, I just don't feel like I get an answer in a timely way. And that hopefully takes a little bit of the feeling of blame off the city councilors if you know they are being expected to do something but they're also you know in a somewhat volunteer voluntary role you know are there ways to make the city council more responsive that don't have to do with just wagging your finger at the elected officials who also you know struggle to get through their lives and and also be you know public officials um Police department, again, you see, you know, that kind of um, more yellow and orange than, than other departments. Um, so you, you know, you have more of the sometimes, I think it's, I wouldn't say it's like completely even, but we get into later and we talk more about the police department um, and break it out below. But, you know, we also we, would, would, lift up that there's a pretty paradoxical view of the police department. They're doing great. I want more of them. I want to see them all the time. I want to shake their hand. Uh, I don't want to see them. I, you know, I don't want to interact with them. I don't think they should exist in, in Montpelier. And, you know, that's a reckoning that they can't be left to manage on their own because it's, you know, we have to be able to figure out who's feeling what way, why, what would help them feel differently, what would need to change about the police department for them to feel differently, what would need to change about their relationships with, you know, police to feel differently if, if police are, you know, going to remain a department of the city of Montpelier, that is, is worth unpacking further. Um, city website and communications, you know, that's where you see the the least feeling of engaged and valued that's kind of interesting you know you like people are probably using the website the most i can tell you in state government um in the pandemic you know whereas before the pandemic there were about a million interactions with state government online in the pandemic there were five million so you know people are exponentially using digital tools to participate in city government or get the information that they need so you know, it's worth noting that people have like this sometimes is very large. They have a pretty hot and cold experience of communications from the city. Yeah, it's because our website is the worst. We do. OK, <laughs> I keep trying to reiterate we are we are working on a, um, a, a transition plan um, for our IT infrastructure. And that's like a real big deal for us right now. Uh, and we know it's bad. So it's nice to have hard data about yeah. how bad it is. what we know. Well, so. <laughs> you can take this and be like, give us the money. And it's just uh, social media. I remember you had said, Cameron, that like you don't have a person who's on the website and that's just like it gets passed around. Is there a person who's on social media too? Um, we have it's me and um uh my office's assistant that does our like this the city's Facebook and um front porch forum posts, and then um individual departments have their own but we don't, we don't have like a person who does that. So 
we do know that that's very, it's very scattershot um, because it is, because we, each department is basically handling their own communications. So something that we obviously can improve on. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And, you know, you may already be doing this, but this is where user experience really matters as you work to improve it. What, you know, what does that look like for people? So they do feel valued and engaged. Um, you know, senior center, I wouldn't even begin to sort of unpack this. Some people might have said never because they don't need to feel engaged and valued, or they might have said that because they have a terrible experience with the senior center. You know, we don't really know about, I, I couldn't tell you about the yellow and orange, but it looks like a pretty healthy amount of people feel engaged and valued who, who would need to by the senior center. Um, public works, you know, just a little bit more again of that even spread. Um, and a lot of unsure. So this is where we just try to break down a little bit. Do you feel engaged and valued by the police department, um, by race? And um, what's interesting is about double the number of white people don't have an opinion, right? Because they don't really feel like they need to interact with the police. They may never have interacted with the police. So already that's interesting data and information. Um, you have more than double the number of people of color who never feel engaged and valued by the police department are in that orange area. A similar number of people feel sometimes engaged and valued. Um, and you have a slightly larger number of people who feel in the BIPOC community who often feel engaged and valued, um, but it goes down significantly. It's about a third of BIPOC folks compared to white folks always feel engaged and valued by the police department. So, and then we asked, we did a similar racial breakdown for fire and rescue. Um, you know, again, really interesting this time, it's more people of color who don't feel like they get as much of the fire and rescue. They have much more of a strong opinion about their interactions with police. Um, and, you know, that I guess if you wanted to compare, for example, 16% of BIPOC folks feel engaged and valued by fire and rescue, 8% feel engaged and valued by the police department. That's a, that alone is a significant difference, but it really goes down quite a bit in the often category. Um, and, you know, it's still, that's still a significant increase in the number of BIPOC folks who have never felt engaged and valued by fire and rescue. Again, that could be because they haven't needed them, but that probably is more of the 51% unsure. So it's really worth unpacking, you know, why do they very significantly never feel engaged and valued by fire and rescue? Um, you know, and then, you know, you still, these are still somewhat significant. I mean, there's just a lot to unpack here for people's experience with police, fire and rescue. Um, this was interesting because we, you know, we broke out the clerk's office because we were like, well, that looks pretty positive overall, you know, and it remains fairly positive. And, you know, it's, that's useful because you also have very few people, probably this is the division or department in city government where you're most likely to interact with people. So there's the fewest who are unsure, like they, you know, they have an opinion on the clerk's office, but, you know, a very few white people feel never engaged and valued by the city clerk's office. Six times more BIPOC folks never feel engaged and valued by the city clerk's office. Um, you know, and then you have kind of similar, not like too dramatic of a spread with often and sometimes, but you know, you're really getting that that hot and cold experience with BIPOC folks feeling never engaged and valued more than they always feel engaged and valued, as opposed to, you know, 10 times more white folks feel always engaged and valued in the clerk's office than never engaged and valued. So, you know, we, this helps us pull apart a lot of departments in city government and say, okay, well, even if it looks pretty good on the surface, you know, there's, there's some stories here. There's something deeper here about people of color not feeling particularly engaged and valued by the city clerk's office, whereas that number seemed really positive and high because a lot of white people have a very positive interaction with the clerk's office. So, you know, something to better understand. So um, city council, so this came up, you know, and there's probably other ways we could 
break this down. Um, you know, this was, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. I'm not even sure if there's ever been a person of color on the city council in Montpelier. So, you know, sometimes it's, it's also a function of reflective democracy. You know, how, how would you feel engaged and valued by a body that in many ways maybe has never reflected your lived experience? I don't know, but you know, you can, you can see it pretty strongly in the only 3% of people of color say they always feel engaged by, by the city council, whereas almost a quarter of white people feel that way. Um, and then, you know, the spread again in the often and sometimes isn't quite as dramatic until you get over to the never. And again, double the people of color never feel engaged and valued. Um, and a slight percentage more don't have an opinion, which also might mean they just don't feel touched or connected to the city council. Um, so we, you know, we tried to just kind of organize the um, ideas for change that we received from people. We received a lot of qualitative feedback, which is great. Um, we can give you the full list. You know, these are the things that felt like they came up the most. Um, and I see a few spelling errors in there, so I will fix those. <laughs> That's my strong suit usually in the consulting group. Um, but if you can get past those, um, you know, these were things that I would say came up in the focus groups and the surveys that felt actionable, that were echoed by city staff, but also just kind of came up quantitatively quite a bit in, in the um, comments. So, um, you know, none of these are easy. I have worked in city government. I'm not saying operational is like you can snap your fingers and do it, but it is more of what we would call a technical challenge to overcome you can bring in experts and they would make up the bulk of the solutions, you know, toward um, addressing the issue. Relational is gonna take a lot more of that. People wanna sort of experience city government from an external perspective differently. It's what we might call an adaptive challenge because you have to bring in different stakeholders who have very different opinions on what's next. And our third sort of category of structural change takes both. It takes budget, expertise, you know, relational um, stakeholder buy-in, et cetera. And they're just kind of bigger, more long-term issues. So in the operational category, um, more of that accommodations and access, you know, which there are sort of kind of standard ways to create more of that accommodation, improve the website. Cameron is on there. So, you know, as, as you named, it's a, a, it's in many ways an operational challenge that you all are working on. Um, conducting anti-racism trainings for staff that you can do without, you know, that may or may not have the impact of a structural change, like, you know, making city government more welcoming for people of color, but you can operationally add into the budget, you know, that ability to do anti-racism and implicit bias training. Um, maintaining remote meeting participation that came up not just in that you know key piece about 57 percent of folks wanted to participate that way but in the comments as well um we meant to sort of ask you this cameron but time got away from us but you know people have really strong opinions about city hall's amenities and just yeah. city amenities so i'm sure you know that <laughs> yeah i so in, I, i'm wondering about including that because in this mm because I hear you and I hear it as a thing, but it's, it's because of COVID, right? Like our bathrooms right, right. were open. And they so they were open and they closed them. Okay. Yeah. They, they've just, the only reason that they're closed right now is because of COVID and they will be open again, July 6th. And so like, it, it's less of a, to me, a systemic change and more of the circumstances of this past year. So yeah. we, we will open them. That is not even, it's not even a question. It's not even a concern. We will open them. Do we need more bathrooms that are 24 hour and clean and safe? Yes. That is an ongoing conversation. Opening city hall bathrooms, not even a conversation. They will be open July 6th. So that's really helpful to know. And I think, I think what was it, it probably the shorthand, you know, this is why it's a draft. The shorthand got turned into, you know, People, people, you could tell people care about access to bathrooms in downtown. Yeah. And that comes up in a lot of cities. And the shorthand of open city hall bathrooms probably 
doesn't really get at the the bigger issue, like you said, of the structural change people want. But just know people are very excited for you to reopen a lot yeah. of parts of City Hall and the City Hall bathrooms, but we will reword that or sort of take yeah. it off. As a, but it's, it, I mean, you know, it could be a structural really thing. Hmm? Yeah. I mean, it could be a structural thing about like the restrooms, but um, yeah. Are they, are they also, do they tend to be more accessible than other restrooms? I mean, you know, do they I, honestly, I think it's because we're open at, at consistent hours. People yeah. They are. It's a very like good touchstone. It's downtown. It's not state run, which I think people feel intimidated by. Um, honestly, mm. um, it's not private. So, like it's not a private business, so people feel safe coming in. Also, it is uh, accessible for folks who have um, disabilities. So I think that um, not all bathrooms downtown can say that. So, yeah. right. Um. Yeah, and I, you know, what I'm surprised somehow didn't make it on here because I think it's in the report and it should be, or I will work. <laughs> the 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 longer term structural change that staff and others have acknowledged is just physically accessible, inviting spaces that you know came up as a theme of the direction that the city wants to go. That's very much heralded and welcome in the community. So I, like you said, it's not just the bathrooms, it's the access, it's the ease for seniors and people with disabilities. Um, on the relational side, so stuff that, you know, is hopefully kind of short or medium term, not like really big structural change, although these things turn into, you know, structural change over time, um, Im improved communication and outreach really targeted to underserved populations. You know, it it did come up the the there was a lot of city folks who said, I'm not sure, you know, how I would integrate equity into my work. And, you know, communication is a is a great place to start, you know. So that was an area where we thought there was a lot of room for growth around communications and how you weave equity into those. Um, this again, you know, this doesn't have to be city councilors who are responsible for some kind of acknowledgement of receipt of communication, but that did come up quite a bit. And like we said, there was a huge difference in how heard people felt by the city council. Some people, you know, felt like they never even got a response. And is that okay? Are you, is it okay to just never hear back from your city council? What do you do then? Um, and, you know, I think this is shorthand too that I would probably edit. Um, this is a draft, um, but, you know, there was a lot about can, can the city do more surveying, polling, you know, information gathering fairly regularly um, to, to keep a pulse and, and even look at what success looks like. Well, fewer people are saying they have an unmet need, you know, more people are saying they feel engaged and heard. So you can be kind of benchmarking, are you making progress? Um, you know, these were some of the more structural and long-term things that, that came up quite a bit in the comments. Um, you know, housing, statewide issue, totally get it, you know, even the divide in terms of staff feeling like we love Montpelier, we grew, we've grown up in the county and the area, and we just never feel like we could afford to be in Montpelier. Um, and, you know, we, I don't know a lot of what's been going on with um, discrimination or sort of people feeling like, you know, people experiencing homelessness are being marginalized, but um, that was, you know, a theme for a certain pocket of folks. Um, review and revise policies through an equity lens. That's fairly common. That comes up a lot in communities that are on a journey to, to an equity plan. Um, and, you know, eventually hiring more women and, and BIPOC staff into the city. Um, and the, well, these- I had a, Sorry, I had a question about that. Did you look how did, how are you getting that? What is that recommendation coming from? Is that from and so I was just going to remind folks, these are the things that people wrote for, for someone like Sue, particularly she, you know, we wanted to keep it really separate. The things that we observed and would recommend as consultants um, okay. from the things that came very strongly from the community. And this showed up in different ways. Like, you know, there, there should be more women or BIPOC staff in a certain department. There should be, you know, they, they should feel more welcome to work here, that 50% of the staff should be women in BIPOC, you know, so mm -hmm. people had this, but we, I just want to reiterate, and we, maybe we should make it clearer in the presentation yeah. that 
th these are these this is our summary of the qualitative pieces of the survey and okay. the yeah, I think having that in like the the at least just the heading of this is like yeah community feedback ideas exactly. you know exactly. instead of like yeah. creative discourses <laughs> yes yeah. yeah yeah ours are further down um but you're right it does not say that and hence it's a draft so appreciate that um this was the you know kind of major themes from policing we you know there were lots of scattershot kind of feedback but this came up time time and time again and i would not necessarily you know just call creating a mental health crisis response team operational but you know, there's no there's not a lot of low hanging fruit in policing and police reform public safety um but you know there there are some more operational elements of do you have you know a crisis response that is not police do you have someone available eight hours who's a social worker or 24 hours you know how, what does that look like um and then relational you know again this came from the community but this mm -hmm. you know this is still a shorthand that i don't think quite works yet you know they but i think it came from people who are on different sides of their experience or feeling about police that they wanted them to be more approachable and less intimidating um but you know some people were like i want to see them in the neighborhood all the time and other people just didn't want them in police cars all the time in their neighborhood but you know they just there was a uniting theme around having them be more approachable um structurally you know this i i, I we don't have a question that gets at the quantitative like the number of people who want to disarm the police or decrease the presence of armed police we just have that data that shows what people's experience feeling engaged and valued by the police department is um but i can say you know again in our focus groups with emergency services folks what came up that i thought was valuable to know among other things is that it was hard for other first responders to do their job when people thought that they were the police. So if they were trying to respond to a crisis without police intervention, they, it took a long time to de-escalate people. And most of what they would try to say to de-escalate people is, I am not the police, the police are not coming. Um, and so, you know, there it seemed to speak to, you know, a challenge de-escalating situations that might not require a police response, um, even when the police aren't present just that there the idea that the police could come just makes it hard to de-escalate situations for emergency services folks um so these are just a couple of you know our recommendations that um came from some of the feedback we heard but you know some people might not it didn't show up in the feedback from the survey so again now this is us sort of what we've observed and seen in the data from the survey and the focus groups um you know that is kind of early feedback um you know all of these things then require more planning etc and other policy changes that might take you you might take a deeper dive into with an equity lens into how do boards and commissions function etc do they offer you know other family supports but um a direction that a lot of communities and you know we're even debating it at the state level are taking is to acknowledge that there's a deep divide and it's grown in the pandemic with who can volunteer their time for free and that means often foregoing um other income or spending more money to volunteer like having to get childcare or get transportation somewhere that they otherwise can't afford and that you know stipends help balance that out or at least make a gesture towards that balance a little bit. I personally and anecdotally have seen it really change who can be at the table, whether it's a one time engagement or long term, you know, making sure someone, you know, is is able to get to community meetings as a leader. Um, so, you know, that is one way to sort of give a nod to that journey of like, is there food, childcare, income replacement, other other things available to help people participate in a lot of the many processes you have going on in the city of Montpelier. Um, we, um, you know, this often comes up because when communities are, are new in their, you know, equity planning journey, 
um, we we noted that in our in our own work that we didn't have enough relationship. We didn't quite, you know, it takes a lot of intense budgeting and planning and relationship building um, that didn't make sense necessarily for our short term engagement to get limited English proficiency households engaged in the process at all. So currently, you know, while we had people who might identify as first generation Vermonters or Americans and immigrants who, you know, might have come as a young person or their parents were immigrants, we don't believe, you know, and, and I think we would know we didn't talk to anybody who required interpretation or translation to participate in this process. So, you know, we heard a lot about the small, you know, but visible um, community of households that may have limited English proficiency, either with the elders in the house who might not be able to access the senior center or many of the adults. Um, and, you know, it, it takes a little while and, a, and some concerted effort from at least a city, one city staff person to even know, you know, maybe work with the school district, which probably has a better handle on this. What numbers are there? What are the most commonly spoken languages? What services, you know, do they need? And with a language access plan, the idea there is that, um, you know, having worked on the one for the city of Burlington, um, you know, the, the legal requirement is that you, you know, engage in life-saving services, um, you, you, know, you engage translation and interpretation for life-saving services first, then kind of critical services and responsibilities like taxation, et cetera, and then you know, the nice-to-have stuff. And that is hard for a lot of communities because where they see the most need is parks and recreation, but where they might have the most acute need is not having a child interpret for a police officer, right? So you, you, know, you have to be really cognizant of how resources are used and then track it and monitor it from there. But, you know, getting a, a kid a free meal at the park is still really critical, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a delicate balance. Um, so, you know, policing on the community side, which is pretty common, people don't know, you know, what, what options are available to them to address some of the, to offer feedback on policing. Um, you know, we, these are some of the things that we really sat with, given that there was such opposing feedback about the, about policing. Um, I, you know, we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the chief of police. We had, you know, a little bit of a back and forth with dispatch. Um, and we, you know, had a couple of officers um, you know, engaged in our emergency services conversation, and we stayed on the line after to talk more, um, you know, happy to continue. My suggestion is if we want to go, you know, deeper, um, which I'm happy to do, that we do it with the current policing committee. I don't know if it's commissioner committee. I apologize. That's, you know, I think on a timeline to wrap up its work as well, um, you know, but I want to make sure we stay aligned. So we don't want to share this prematurely or in a way that contradicts their work. Um, but, you know, this really comes from acknowledging that we went deep with some affinity groups who have really strong feelings about police. And a lot of what we heard was not headed in one direction. Um, so, you know, what, what I would say we heard a lot of was unresolved trauma from past incidents of use of force that never had a process to acknowledge and restore community harm that was done. Um, you know, having, um, having someone, you know, killed in the community in a, in a police, in an escalated police use of force situation, you know, leaves a lot of community damage and mistrust that has, that kept coming up in our focus groups. Um, you know, we don't want to dictate what the role of law enforcement officers should be in city engagement processes, but it should be clear and consistent and, you know, kind of directed from, it might make the city manager, the city manager's office, the city council that, you know, this is, they have to engage somehow, you know, so I think it's really challenging right now because of high emotions and maybe some of the, you know, kind of unfair or, um, intense feedback that's going to the police department. So there's a desire to kind of protect and not make things worse even. I think it comes from a, a good place, but 
you know, there is a deep desire to build trust, I would say, across the board with the police department. And it was really hard to know how that would be met without more clear, clear, clarity from, you know, the city around how, what that would look like. Um, here we sort of get to the heart of it that it's, it, you know, we have to really stop and acknowledge that the feedback is contradictory. It, it's, it's opposing, it's polarized. And, you know, you can still find common ground there. That doesn't mean all is lost. Um, and it doesn't mean the police department, you know, just throws up its hands and says, we're just going to stay out of this. You know, that's the time to really deepen the engagement and find that common ground and, and make sure that, you know, people who have um, a very negative opinion or feel very unsafe around police officers get to enjoy the same privilege that these, you know, lar large group of folks in the city who feel safe and taken care of by the police, everyone deserves to have that experience. Um, and so how do you, what themes are there about why some people feel really safe and taken care of around the police um, that you can sort of universalize more. Um, but again, it's that desire to build those strong relationships. I think even people who felt like they had come to Montpelier and had really bad and dramatic interactions with the police early on, they also just feel like they've never gotten the opportunity to air that and grieve around that. And, and they don't feel safe in many places in the city. They don't feel, they avoid places, you know, that, that they would otherwise go. And that's, I don't think something the police department wants that people are, you know, really trying not to call them, trying to avoid them. Police departments function based on trust. Um, I think I, you know, I want to dive just we're running out of time and oh, yeah. To, yeah, wrap up and talk about next steps here too. Sorry. There is the last slide. <laughs> Sorry. Policing is such a tough one. You know, I just, it's hard to just be like here, um, you know, here's some, some sentences. Um, so, you know, just wrapping up by saying, you know, um, it, people of color are exhausted. I would, this one about don't engage with people without a specific purpose. I wouldn't even just put that under policing. So I'll probably move that, but there's deep fatigue. You know, there are, are people who we might have really close personal relationships that still told us I'm too tired to do this. You know, I'm too tired for one more meeting, you know, um, and other people who said, I've never been in a space with other people of color in Montpelier before. This is amazing. So, you know, we try to be really careful with that experience of people um, across the board and not overexpose them and overtax them without them feeling some reciprocity, without them hearing, here's what we heard. Is that what makes sense? You should see change, you know, rather than people coming back and asking you again a year later if this is still true for you. Um, and again, you know, that transparency, I think, goes back to the clarity about the roles and expectations um, in city engagement. I'd really like to get um, you, if possible, to present this to my leadership team on staff before it goes to council. I think they're just going to want to just know what, what's being said. So, um, yeah, I'll and we're really, you know, we, the, an assessment is that really early, like here was our methodology. It could have holes in it. It could have, you know, again, we, we wrote some questions down about, you know, there were little, little comments that we might not have understood. Why is it so important? The bathrooms or, you know, what did some, what did someone mean with this feedback? What incident are they referring to that happened two years ago that they haven't, you know, they have lingering trauma around. We don't, have the full picture. So happy, happy to do that and still uh, have it in draft form, which is nice because we have time before that city council meeting where we'd be presenting it as, as somewhat final. Um, so just so folks know who are also listening in, this is also circulating among all of our focus group participants, um, you know, so that if they feel really misrepresented um, or don't understand the way that something ended up being characterized, that we can make that change as well. So I mean, Pellin just hopped off. I think just for me here, if folks have, if if you're, you know, uh, taking a shower and you're like, oh my gosh, no, that's what that meant. Like, let me put these pieces together. We should just email you directly, Keisha. Is that right? Or just like reach out to you directly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was probably cool. best if they go through the city. <clears throat> so you all know what, oh, okay. you know, that your community is engaging and what feedback they have. And if you put us, them in touch with us, you know, I think that allows us all to capture the feedback for when we are not present, you know, that someone on CJAC has a, 
you know, sense of someone's concern and because, you know, at some point we will be not as present, you know, with this yeah. stuff. Can I add something? That, uh, I'm on the police review committee too. I'm the liaison between these two. Um, and we're starting to talk about our recommendations. So I, I don't know if you've talked with Alisa, Alisa recently. We should get this, I think, uh, before us so that if we are going to make recommendations that we include some of what you've discovered. Yeah, Alyssa got this, um, the documents the same time that you all did. Um, huh. And, you know, it's, it's helpful while it's in draft form if it doesn't circulate without context too broadly but we anticipated that she'd figure out how she wanted to share it with okay. all of you and have us. And again, I'm really open to, you know, a session with the city management team and the policing committee or whatever combination I think, you know, and, and police officer, police leadership, you know, I think um, this is one where because the feedback is so contradictory, mm -hmm. you know, we just really want to dig in and, and be, of value to the committee and to the police department on how to move forward with the feedback that they're receiving. Okay, thanks. And so then um, team, I just wanted to check in um, because our next meeting is scheduled for June 9th um, and then we have June 23rd. I don't know if we have an agenda that we should check in on June 9th for as well. Um, and so I don't know if anyone else has like, uh -huh something that they want to offer or if we should just move to June 23rd and like, uh, you know, do, do hear about how the rollout has been going and and uh, make plans for the you know next steps. Does that make sense? You're asking to cancel June 9th and just have a June 23rd? I guess, yeah, well, I'm, I'm proposing that. What do folks think? Yeah. Whatever y'all want to do. Yeah. And I, you know, I can, if you want, let's circle up via email if you want someone from our team to be there. That is the day I fly back from my visit with my grandparents. So, um, was, yeah, but you know, that's well, why we're a team. Yeah. So, yeah, someone else can be here with me today. Jeremy, did you? Um, so, you're proposing canceling June 9th so that we have time for creative discourse to get feedback from other groups or our, give our own feedback to this and then move it more towards a final form. Is that what I understand? Uh, yeah, just I think the, I'm proposing we cancel it because I don't think we have a specific agenda besides, you know, between now and July 7th. And I think let's hold on to the 23rd in case there is a specific agenda, but um, let's, that, that was my proposal, yeah. That sounds good. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Cool. Okay, so we'll won't have a June 9th meeting. June 23rd meeting, we will uh, check in on creative discourse work plan responses from the um, city committee chair meeting follow up and um, fundraising recruitment check ins um, and review and approve the minutes. Not in that order, but I think those are our agenda items. Cool. Great. Thank you so much for joining us, Keisha. I'm sorry, I'm five minutes late to my next meeting, so I'm going to run, but thank you. Yeah, so much and talk to you later. Thanks. Thank you, Keisha. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you Appreciate so much. It. We'll be in touch. Good.